as an even EVA structure for Swedish academic research, which means we are responsible providing the Swedish academic research with uh, large-scale computing and large-scale data storage management of active data sets. These are what we use to call them supercomputers in different ways. And the idea with SNCC is that we should be able to provide services in terms of compute and storage them for those in the Swedish research level that only can be provided at the national level, the sciences, and also to all user research in Sweden. So it's from uh, condensed metaphysics to the humanities gender way, um, in a cost-efficient way. And SNCC then is a consortium of 10 universities, the Sweden's 10 largest universities, from Umeå North to Lund in, in the South, that are running SNCC. And currently we have a six computing center providing the resources in, 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 in for computing. Uh, SNCC funding is funded by two parts, mainly. It's the Research Council and the universities in the consortium. So we have 100 million kroner per year from the Research Council and 64 million in cash from the consortium and additional 30 million in kind for advanced user support. And this is appeared for about five years. So we're supposed to provide uh, large-scale computing and storage in long-term perspective, but with five-year funding and 160 million per year. So this is really a challenge for the long way. So how do we build an infrastructure? What do you need for components to set up an infrastructure for, for research and, and computing? So we need to provide capacity for computing and storage of active data sets for Swedish researchers. And data sets mean we are not responsible for the long-term preservation, we only responsible for data that you have currently using. So this is what the research you need to access to. But to be able to utilize this, we need to add a layer of certain services. You need to alloc allocate resources, you need to apply for resources you can allocate. And SNACMI is a SNCC National Allocation Committee where, uh, where you apply for compute time and you get access to it. You need some kind of project portals. You can handle all your projects and we can handle your applications in different ways. We need first line support. We need advanced use support so that you can use the resources as efficient as possible uh, and the best possible way. And we need training. New, new technology is coming up, new research coming up. So we need to help all the researchers to train everything. So this is really what we need. But then, as an infrastructure, you must also have an extra layer that is normally invisible to the user. We need to have common policies. How do we handle storage? How do we handle application of allocations? How do we get statistics out of the system? Because our funders want to know who has used SNCC and why have we used them, and how will we make sure that you use it for the best possible science in Sweden? We need to consider legal issues. Uh, who can use the system? Uh, we have reasonably discussing things like export control. Can everyone from everywhere in the world use SNCC systems, or do certain countries do not allow to use the systems? We need to consider that. We need to consider GDPR. We need to have licenses. And of course, IT security and information security. So this is a level that we normally, as usage, should not be, be exposed to, but it must be there for the build infrastructure. In addition, we have national collaborations with other research infrastructure, like Max4, uh, SciLab Lab, for instance. We have international collaborations, European Open Science Cloud, the EuroHPC, FRACE, and NAIC. But this is to support us with the researcher to use, fully utilize the possibility to do research. And we have funding for the universities and VR, and we also have external funding, for instance, from the Wallenberg Foundation to, to run our systems. Well, but... As a user, you normally just need the capacity of computing and storage. Okay, so what do the computation landscape look like? So this is an overview, and I will go through the different pillars. So currently, it's based on four, four pillars. Uh, traditional access, special access, cloud access, and stream access. And all are connected in a common infrastructure uh, landscape. Traditional access, what we call HPC. Well, it's not traditional in the sense, doing the same, it's an evolving field. But this is where we have the physics, the chemistry, biology, fluid dynamics, climate, the big users of the field. Uh, they're normally batch jobs. 
So they submit the jobs, they wait for a week, and then they get the results coming back. A lot of parallel computing, you can see here, from, massively parallel, from a few nodes to massively parallel jobs coming out. Uh, the CPU's usage still dominates, because they have codes written for CPU's, codes going back 20, 30 years. But we see, of course, an increase in GPU's and acceleration. And this is the way forward. We will see an increased need of uh, adding GPU support uh, to the codes. And it's really growing, growing fast. And as I said, this is the main usage. More than 90% of our users are using traditional HPC resources. And we recently decided to invest further in new capacities. We'll extend our services from 2021. And also one issue we've been in infrastructure, it, it's a long period from the decision to, to invest in capacity until we have the system in place. On the other side, we also have the cloud system, cloud access, uh, which mainly attracts new research areas and novel workflows. Uh, today, we see mainly use for life science, but we've also seen some use for material physics, material chemistry coming up in the systems. And we also see here collaboration within the Nordic countries and also within the European community. We have, for instance, the European Open Science Cloud, and we have projects within the Nordic e infrastructure collaboration on cloud computing in different ways. And we have experimented and we successfully set it up as a national federated services where we have resources on three different SNCC partners collaborating on running the system. And then we have dedicated systems. Um, and it goes back to the field um, when all users didn't fit into one, one model. The traditional HPC running batch job, CPUs, a little bit storage. And it came normally from the life science region about eight years ago, um, where we had a fast growing set of users with little experience of HPC. They needed a large storage, had large storage needs, large memory needs, but small CPU needs. And they didn't fit into normal picture. And we also saw many different workflows and different ways of doing it. We saw needs for uh, interactivity combined with batch jobs uh, and a very large and fast growing software stack with non major codes. So in the end, it turned out that we had a specific system for, for the life science people. And that's been really successful having as a separate, separate field. Another special access is sensitive personal data, SNCC's sense system. This is also a field growing out from the life science part, uh, starting out with the national genomics infrastructure need of sequencing human data. And then we need to do an analysis of the data, large storage needed, and it must be done in a secure way because this is human data. It was a lot also for not so much on the technology side, but <coughs> quite a lot on the legal side. How do you handle data that is sensitive personal data? How do you set up a system that is secure in different ways? Uh, so our case is a computer services and it's based on a cloud solution with a secure interface. Uh, <coughs> and recently we did discussing Nordic collaboration between Sweden, Finland and Norway about how can we share resources for sensitive personal data so that we still fulfill the legal requirements, but we can share then the competencies and, and resources. Uh, and this is a resource that's funded by the Wallenberg Foundation, Research Council, the Uppsala University and Silas Lab. And here we see also an increased uh, need for then these sensitive data resources. The next step then coming up for us also is then the machine learning part. And this is one thing that we've been lacking about. And we all see the, the report by, by the Swedish infrastructure AI. And we will set up an AI resource as a part of the SNCC infrastructure. Uh, funding from the Valabay Foundation, and then SNCC will fund operations on the system. Uh, and the idea is then to, to put it into the SNCC e infrastructure. So we utilize all the expertise we have built up through the years. We have a long experience, as I said, of different workflows. We can experience at HPC, cloud, batch usage, interactive usage in different ways. We know how to handle storage, storage of large data sets. We know how to handle large and diverse software stacks. And we also need to handle a diverse set of users and research fields. Allocation will be through the SNCC uh, allocation committee, SNAC, but we need to develop new ways of allocation because it's a different allocation model that's needed. And we're already starting looking how can we have use support and training for these 
these fields come in. Uh, and also one lesson we learned from the life science side is that we need to have a close collaboration with the researcher when setting up a new resource. Because we need a research input for how do you use the system? What requirements do you have for computing and storage? How is your workflow in an efficient way? So we're planning to set it up as a, as a system in two stages, where the first stage will be used for working and getting the experience and the workflows. How can we set up novel access models? How can we see what usage we're looking for? The balance between GPUs, do we need CPUs? What kind of storage do we need use support? And this should be in place in, in the summer of 2020. And while we are setting up the first stage, we'll start working on a second stage based on the experience from the, the first one coming up. But the idea is then to see SNCC infrastructure as one infrastructure. It's not several parts. It's all connected. Uh, and for AI, for instance, we'll see that appearing in the HPC part. We'll see it in the, in the secure sensitive data systems. We probably will see you see it in all the different fields with the PDFs. Okay, so that was computing. Uh, but we also need to couple it with some storage. And then we have in SNCC a common storage infrastructure. Um, and the, the idea is to have storage on several levels. We have a center storage for each resource. We have a center storage for, the, for storing close to the computer systems. We have a national accessible storage, so you can move data between the systems, and also storage for a longer time. We have tape storage or backup, so we can also store it on tape system for a slower access. And we have a server system with sensitive data, which means special requirements stored. And also, what, there's a lot of things happening, of course, in, in terms of data, big data. And I guess you all are familiar with the FAIR principles that need to adopt till, too, in terms of handling data. Uh, we increase need of having data management plans. If you apply for the Research Council for grants, you need to provide a data management plan now. And we need to consider cross-border collaborations. So how can we collaborate within the Nordic countries, within Europe? Uh, and this is something that's growing very, very fast to be more and more important. And of course, if you have uh, being a user, you must make sure that you can use the systems as efficient as, as possible. So we have a set of advanced user support to make this uh, uh, possible to get help in optimizing the, the course codes and running the systems. And this is coordinated at a national level. So re regardless where, you, where you're working in Sweden, you should have access then to advanced user support. And we'll have an increase then of focus on user training and education. So it's a continued uh, education services. Okay, so how do you get access to the SNCC resources? So we have something called a super portal, uh, where you can go and apply. And I should state that the SNCC services are free of charge. There's no cost. Uh, and access is granted on three levels, large, medium, and small. And large, is this is the, the level where the highest scientific excellence are needed to be granted for large systems. It's granted by excellence and by uh, uh, technical feasibility. And then we have smaller allocation, medium and small, where you might need to show technical feasibility. And we have one, as I say, one entry point where you apply for this in different ways. Okay, who is using the SNCC resources? The blue curves is number of projects, and the red dotted line is number of core hours. So up to the left, you see physics, biology, chemistry, mechanics, climate. So this is the traditional fields that are using uh, high performance computing for a long time. Many projects, many computing times. And then we have the big dip. And that big dip is then value or big data or life science, where we have large need of computing, but a large need of storage, but not so much need of computing. So many projects, but not so much computing. And then comes some other fields, IT and computer. And then after the far left, you have this long tail of science. So we also have users from, from forestry and fisheries, psychology, political sciences, language and literature, etc. Then they don't use so much core hours, but a few core hours they, they, they use is extremely important for their science. They have high quality publications using a little bit of SNCC infrastructure. 
So this shows the, the, the one, also one of the problems that we have with InSNCC, because we have a large usage from large fields. So if now we squeeze in machine learning and AI, AI, AI into this picture, how can we accommodate new fields coming in? Okay, and we also have national and international collaborations. Uh, and we have one special task in, in Sweden to collaborate with other research infrastructure providing the E infrastructure for them. So for the high energy physics community and for life science, for instance, we provide computing and storage resources for them. And you're also part of several European collaborations like Praise for high performance computing and EU Data for Storage and EOC European Open Science Cloud for this new data movement that's going on in Europe. <coughs> and NAQUIST and the Nordic E infrastructure collaboration. And then about two years ago, we heard a little bit about this before, but suddenly the UHPC uh, turns up. So UHPC is an initiative for acquiring and providing world-class petascale and pre-exascale uh, supercomputing and data infrastructures should be in place by early 2021 now, and supporting the building of an exascale system built on European technology. Uh, it's a large investment within Europe, uh, about 1 billion euros, and for the Swedish users, we see that the UAPC is now funding three pre exascale systems. The procurement has started, so we have about slightly more than one year that will be in place. And of these pre exascale systems, 50% will be available to apply for in competition. So you as a Swedish researcher can apply them for, for these resources. Uh, and Sweden participates explicitly in one of the systems, the Lume system, who will be about 150 petaflops uh, situated in Finland. Uh, so the Swedish contribution corresponds about 3.5% of the whole system. So that means that beside the, the possibility to apply for, for general resources, the dedicated capacity for Sweden. And this system is massively built on GPUs. So there will be an AI module in that system that will be available for Swedish researchers in different ways. Okay. Challenges. As I said, we are the second largest research infrastructure in Sweden. We have 160 million per year, but just over a five year period. So we have a short term funding, but we have a long term responsibility. And some of the challenges we see that is that we see a continued high usage of computer resources for the existing fields like physics, chemistry, biology, etc. And they need these resources. It's important that we can have them in place. At the same time, we see in the number of research fields that need computing and storage are growing very fast, and that a smaller usage of compute power can have a high scientific impact and be of national importance. So they need, need to be balanced by supporting the large-scale users they already have, at the same time providing these new fields coming in. And we see new, new use patterns, right? Beside the traditional HPC or batch jobs, machine learning is coming, but the cloud resource, the visualization, the need of different operation systems, interactivity, of course, coming in, challenging the traditional way of setting up compute systems that we somehow need to handle. We also sense see an increased need for resource for sensitive personal data. And this must be separate systems, right? We can't include them in the systems that we have for HPC resources. Another issue is, of course, the flow of open research data. We see that an important uh, need of handling data from data generation, analysis, and long-term preservation. Uh, where is SNCC's role here? Right now we have the responsibility for active data, but we need to have a flow for so the researcher don't need to think about where we have the systems. And then finally, so the SNCC computational landscape covers then high performance computing, we have cloud computing, services, special systems, and now we will have uh, resources for machine learning and artificial intelligence. Everything coupled to a storage system, we have con user support combining everything. And it should be seen like one whole unit. It's not separate systems, everything works together. Resources are placed in different places in Sweden, all interconnected. So we provide a functional and efficient ecosystem for large scale computing and storage working together. And we've been doing this since 2003. We have a long experience of providing services and supporting the full scientific workflows. And we do so for a diverse set of research and research areas. Um, as I said, we are an integrated national available use, use support and also a well established mechanism then for resources to users. Okay, thank you.
Thank you so much. Do we have uh, questions? Yeah, one in the back. Thank you for the great talk. So I'm based at Uppsala University, and um, because all of this infrastructure is rigged for research, right? So we have all these data science programs all over Sweden popping up, and it's becoming increasingly attractive to use the AWS $300 yeah. per year to get the students launched off on it, which is actually not very good from a you know, broader point of view, right? So are there any plans in SNCC to also allow for very small micro-resources for student training in Sweden, so they're not locked in from the get-go? For SMEs, yeah. So, so we need to work closer with the industry and SMEs, right? As long as we're doing open science. We can have collaborative projects as long as the result is published and open science. Um, but this is something that we're really discussing because we need to meet closer interaction. If you look at the Euro HPC, for instance, they have said explicitly that 20% of resources should be allocated to collaboration with SMEs. So this is, uh, and, and the problem is for the funding model with the Research Council just looking at the research data. But since we also have funding for the universities, this is something that needs to be looked into. Yeah. I wonder about the cloud part. Mm -hmm. Are you having uh, Kubernetes infrastructure in place and are you using that to host the services for researchers, et cetera? No, this is based on OpenStack uh, for the moment, yes. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I think that was all. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for an excellent talk. Thank you.